All right, let's get started. Um, we have a lot to talk about in today's lecture called The German Question Between 1763 and 1787. It gets a little sticky towards the end. I am warning you about that now. On Wednesday, we discussed the French Revolution. There will be a long time out in the French Revolution. And I also intend to inaugurate on Wednesday, even a little bit here today, a practice I have of asking questions about the lecture given previously. Just one or two today. Who is Frederick the Great? Somebody tell me. Someone upstairs. Go ahead, the man, stand up. You don't need, what's your name? Connor. Connor, what's Frederick, who's Frederick the Great? The King of Prussia. Who's Maria Theresia? Empress of Austria. Okay. Who is Catherine the Great? Empress of Russia. How does Catherine come to the throne? She kills her. You guys are catching on fast. <laughs> what's the capital of the Holy Roman Empire? What's the capital of the Holy Roman Empire? It's a trick question. There isn't any. I'll talk about that today. What, now you know, what was the name, main treaty we spoke of before at the end? Kuchikanyachi. That's the treaty you will not be able to get through the day without thinking about. You're going to be obsessed with the treaty of Kuchikanyachi. What were the overriding considerations in the power constellation of Europe between 1768 and 1774? Who's strong? Russia. Russia. Who rules Russia? Catherine the Great. All right. We're going to talk today. As I, now we'll have a, I, will, I will review the material today at some length, at some length, maybe for 20 minutes on Wednesday. I have to, guys, I have to get in a lot today. I'm sorry to, to go through the course. The course was, is, is two, two days less than it ordinarily would be. Okay, we're going to talk about the German question between 1763 and 1787. However, in order to understand the German question between 1763 and 1787, we've got to reach back in time to different dates in the 17th and the 18th century. What is the German question? Schemes. It is alliances. It is appearances, and it is realities. It is schemes. It is alliances. It is projects, appearances, and realities. Who makes up the German question and the time we're going to talk about three Three bodies. Notice I do not say states or powers. Number one, the Holy Roman Empire. Two, the Habsburg monarchy. The Holy Roman Empire, the Habsburg monarchy. And three, and three, Prussia. The Holy Roman, let's start with the Holy Roman Empire. We said at the beginning of the last hour, by 1763, the Holy Roman Emperor had fallen on hard times. Let's elaborate a little bit on about that. Why did the Holy Roman Empire fall on hard times by the year 1763? There are four reasons. Number one, number one, wars of religion. War that start that start with the Protestant Reformation in the 16th century that continue in the 17th century century with a terrible conflict that breaks out called the Thirty Years' War. In the 18th century, there's such a thing as wars of dynastic success. They weaken the Holy Roman Empire. The wars of the Protestant Reformation, the Thirty Years' War, the Thirty Years and the wars of the 18th century called wars of dynastic succession, point one, weakening two. Two, the intervention in the affairs of the Holy Roman Empire of outside power. Some were great at one time. Denmark is one. Sweden, when Sweden intervened in the 17th century, was a great power. Sweden no longer is. And the third power is France. Denmark, Sweden, and France. 
get intervene constantly in the affairs of the Holy Roman Empire. Something else developing in the Holy Roman are two are two states that hate each other: Austria and Prussia. Austria and Prussia, and four economics. Some states at the western end of the Holy Roman, some small states, border on France, and they want to be just like the King of France. What do they do? They spend money on mistresses and palace, and they go broke. They go out of existence. So four things to remember. One, wars of religion. 16th century, Protestant Reformation. 17th century, the Thirty Years' War. 18th century, the wars of dynastic succession. We're going to talk about two of them today. And finally, people go for spending money on their girlfriends and palaces and so forth. The kings do that. Yeah, they want to imitate the king of Versailles, the king of France. All the same, the Holy Roman Emperor and Emperor had two, two important functions by, the, by 1763. The, the Emperor functions, the, the Empire functions as a community, a community of justice, and also it functions as a community of symbolism. The Holy Roman Emperor is supposed to adjudicate disputes, to adjudicate disputes between the smaller states. He's supposed to adjudicate disputes, disputes between the smaller states, and to a community of symbols. The crowning of the Holy Roman Emperor is a great event in European history. It is not unlike the 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 coronation of the Pope. It is splendor. It is majestic. It, 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 it is full of pomp, pomp and it is, it, it is viewed by, by everybody who's any, anybody in Europe, the crowning of the Holy Roman Empire. That is one of the things the Holy Roman Empire does. <coughs> what it does best, what it does best, in, in one sense, it, exp- it, it expands, it consolidates, it initiates. It now, it now limits, now limits, it now retracts, it now it now withdraws. Don't worry about that. It was just a line in a lecture that I could not remember. You remember remember what it did. The, 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 four th- the four things that make the Holy Roman Empire weak. The wars of religion of the 16th century, it's the Protestant Reformation. In the 17th century, it's something called the Thirty Years' War. A war broke out in the year 1618 and raged across Europe for 30 years. It weakens the Holy Roman Empire. In the 18th century, in the 18th century, there were wars. There were wars of dynastic succession. There were wars of dynastic succession. And then the, the, the intervention, the intervention in, in its affairs of outside power. Denmark is the first, Sweden is the second, and France is the third. France is constantly doing this in the Holy Roman Empire and the rise within the Holy Roman of two great states who hate each other, Prussia and Austria. And, and so, uh, some of the, the petty kings at the western end of the empire go broke trying to pay for their girlfriends and palaces and so forth. So the Holy Roman Empire, by 1763, it's, it, but it still serves as a community of symbols, the, uh, the, the pomp, pomp and circumstance. Pomp and ceremony attend the coronation of the Holy Roman Emperor. Every time this happens, and remember, remember, guys, the emperor the, is what? What distinguishes the emperor from everything else? He is elected. Very good. He's elected, yes, by the eight largest states in the emperor. And, he, and, and he, he's, a, he's supposed to adjudicate disputes between the smaller states. He's supposed to adjudicate disputes between the smaller states. You understand that very well. Let's go on now and discuss the Habsburg Mont or Austria. There is a problem in Austria in the year 1711. The emperor of Austria died in the year 1711. The emperor's name, the emperor's name was Joseph I. Joseph didn't have any kids. He is succeeded by his brother. His brother's name is Charles VI. Charles and his wife had two, tr- two sons. Two sons, they both die. They have a daughter, born in the year 1717, and another daughter born later. They live. It is clear 
to Charles the Sixth, and remember, Charles the Sixth is Habs- emperor of the Habsburg monarchy, and also Holy Roman Emperor as well. It is clear to Charles the Sixth that he's going. He's going to be succeeded by a woman, a, tw- a, a woman born in the year seventeen seventeen. Just one problem. The laws of the Habsburg monarchy do not allow for a woman to succeed the throne. They do not allow for a woman to succeed the throne. And he knows, he knows his daughter, born in 1717, named Maria Theresa, is going to be his heir. But she can't be. What does he do? In 1713, in the year 17, Charles, Charles issues a doctrine called the Pragmatic Sanction. Now, I don't have this, I put this on the P-R-A-G-M-A-T-I-C. Pragmatic Sanction. In the year 1713, what does it say? It's cool for Maria Theresia to ascend the throne. That's all. What does he do? He has to bargain with the states of Europe to make, to make sure that when Maria, he died, that none of them take advantage of the succession question. None of them take advantage of the succession question. That he spends all of his time, all of his written trying trying to get the powers to accept, to accept this pragmatic, and they accept the pragmatic sanction of 1713, but they do so with their fingers crossed and behind their back. He dies in the year 1740. The 23-year-old daughter, Maria Theresia, ascends the throne. I should say this. Charles has spent all of his life Trying to bargaining with the other powers, giving away this, giving away in order to make to make sure they accept the pragmatic sanction. He's got not one thing about preparing his daughter to succeed, and she doesn't know anything when she comes to the throne. This provokes a crisis in the year 1740. You know a little bit about this. There's another monarch who comes to the throne, throne in the year 1740. His name is Frederick the Great. He's not known as the Great yet, but he's going to be. So we'll call him Frederick the Great. Frederick the Great thinks there's going to be a succession, and he doesn't expect any of the other powers to honor the pragmatic sanction and something else. He believes Maria Theresa, who cannot, who cannot sit on the throne of the Holy Roman Emperor, because that's empire, that's got to be a guy. Her husband's going to need his vote. So what does he do? He invades Silesia. We talked about that before. Silesia is the richest province in Europe. The richest province in Europe. Maria Theresia views this, views, views this as not an act of war, but he, she, she views it as a crime. It, set, it, it sets off the, what is called the War of Austrian Succession. The war rages on for eight years, rages on for eight years between Frederick the Great, Frederick the Great and Maria Therese, Austria, Austria and Prussia. There is a preliminary peace reached in 1745 in which Frederick says it's cool for, for Maria's, Maria's husband, and I put his name on B, B course, Francis Stephen. You guys can spell Francis Stephen of Lorraine. Francis Stephen to become Holy Roman Emperor, and he, be, he becomes Holy Roman Emperor in 17, 1745. 1745. He's on the throne until 1765. So that, that is the preliminary piece. The war ends the war ends in 1748. What does the peace say in 1748 that ends the war? Frederick says it's cool with me for Maria Theresa to be empress of the Habsburg monarchy. Maria says it's cool if Frederick takes Silesia. Neither, let us to say, by, by, neither, neither of these powers, Fred, neither Frederick or Maria Theresa is sincere. This, this, this peace is not expected to last. This peace is not expected to last at all. And they, they go on. They start, they, start, they start preparing for a new war. They start preparing for a new war. A little bit about this, this very sharp woman, Maria Theresa, born in the year 1717, 23 years of age when she comes to the throne. Her old man told her nothing, not a thing about how to run the affairs of state. He was trying to get everybody to accept this pragmatic sanction. She marries, I don't know when, Francis Stephen, 
in the 1730s. Francis Stephen of Lorraine, who becomes Holy Roman Emperor in 1745, in this preliminary piece. So they have six, she loves her husband very much. They have 16 kids. 16 kids, I'm telling you that's the truth. One of these children is Marie Antoinette of fame later on. Marie Antoinette's going to marry the king of France. She's going to get, you know what happens to her in the French Revolution? She gets her head cut off. That's coming on Wednesday. I don't want to give all the good lines away. Especially when the lecture is as heavy as it is today. Okay. Marie, she's a devout Catholic. A devout Catholic. She's a, 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 a a, a, a sharp cookie, a very sharp observer of the international scene, and, and, and her husband. She loves her husband very much. He becomes Holy Roman Emperor in, 17, in 1745. She is on the throne from 1740 until 1780. She dies in the year 1780. She is succeeded. She is succeeded by her son, Joseph II. Her husband dies in the year 1765. In 1765, Joseph becomes Holy Roman Emperor. In 1780, Joseph becomes Emperor of the Habsburg Monarchy. Joseph is an altogether different, different character than Maria Theresia, an altogether different character than Maria Theresia. Joseph is basically an agnostic. It's basically an agnostic. He does two things. He does two things. Number one. He proclaims, no sooner does he come to the throne, then he proclaims something called the Toleration Act. He wants to limit very much the authority of the Catholic Church. Every religion, every confession, Protestant, Jew, Orthodox Christian, is welcome to come to the Holy Roman Emperor and worship and work. And he restricts the influence and the power of the Catholic Church the influence and the power of the Catholic Church, very much. Jesuits. And two, Joseph wants, now listen, Joseph wants to use, we know he's only Roman emperor in 1760. He wants to use his position as Holy Roman Emperor to strengthen Austria's position in Germany. He wants, we'll see how he does it, he wants to use his position as Holy Roman Emperor to strengthen Austria's position in Germany. Now, got a little ahead of myself. Maria Theresia is upset at the outcome of the war of Austrian succession. What Maria Theresia does, before her, even before her son comes to the throne, she reforms her empire. She reforms her empire from top to bottom. She reforms her empire militarily. She reforms her empire economically. She reforms her empire administratively, militarily. All officers who serve for 20 years, all officers who serve for 20 years or more are made nobles. They're made nobles. She makes a, a, a beautiful, a beautiful school, military, a military school in Vienna to recruit officers in the Austrian army. Two, taxes. No, remember now, she made nobles out of the officers who served 20 years or more in the Austrian army. Those guys now must pay taxes. They must pay taxes. And the, the, no, the, the, no, the old nobility, they must pay more. They must pay more. The old nobility pay more. The new nobility paid some. New nobility made out of these, 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 these officers who were, made, who were noble, who were served 20 years in the army. And three, administrative. She, she, the old man, the old man had nine or ten chancellors for, for every part of the empire. Hungary, Bavaria, you don't have to remember. Hungary, Bavaria, uh, Ch uh, 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 Prague, Bohemia. She centralized in there. In, into two, two distinct by two distinct two distinct chancellors run the emperor. One's in the east and one's in the west. One is in the east and one's in the west. And they 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 report directly. They report directly to her. They report directly to her. So she centralizes the administration of Ravana. She makes two chancellors out of ten. It's very effective. And they, re they report directly to the empress of the Holy Roman Empire, of, of, of the Austrian, of the Habsburg monarch. 
Sorry, bad slip of the tongue. Maria, Therese, so one, she ennobles all the officers who have served 20 years or more in the officer. They're made nobles. Two, she's got this military school, military school in Vienna, to attract all kinds of officers in the Austrian army. All these new nobles now pay taxes. The old nobility, the taxes on them, they're increased. And she centralizes her, the Austrian Empire, by dividing it basically into two parts, a, a, a western part and an eastern part. A western part and an eastern part. They report. They report directly to her. Directly to her. We know Joseph comes to the throne in 1780. 1765, his father dies, he becomes Holy Roman Emperor. He passes the Toleration Act. It's cool for Jews to come to the emperor. He wants to restrict very much the influence of the Catholic Church. And he wants to use his position as Holy Roman Emperor to, 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 to uh, uh, take, uh, take advantage. And Austria's Austria's influence in Germany. Austria's influence in Germany to use to as a lever to expand Austria's influence in Germany. Well, now let's talk a little bit about the Kingdom of Prussia. And in order to understand this, we've got we make this point. Pers, I'm going to make this point again and again and again. Personalities count in history. When Vienna, a city. Vienna as a city, as a cosmopolitan city, stretch back to Roman times when Vienna, in that Berlin, the capital of Prussia, was a fishing village on the spray, a fishing village on the spray, a tiny little nothing on the spray river. How does Prussia become a great power? No, it, no, no, it can be reduced to three. The, 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 great, the greatness of three kings, the brilliance of three absolutely extraordinary, extraordinary monarchs. They are one. The great elector of Brandenburg, B-R-A-N-D-E-N-B-U-R-G. That's not even Prussia, but don't worry about that. The great elector of Brandenburg, too. Frederick William I, Frederick William I, and three, and three, Frederick the Great. Let me give you the dates. The great elector on the, uh, Brandenburg from 17, 1640, 1640, 1640 to 1688. Frederick William I on the throne from 1613, 1713, 1713 to 1740. And Frederick the Great, Frederick the Great on the throne from 1740 to 1786, 1786. Let's talk about the great elect. Brandenburg is a is a is a, is a state is a you know, was, was what is a state in the Holy Roman Empire. It's not even Prussia. It's going to be soon. What does the great elector do? We not need to remember his name. The great elector does this. He defeats Sweden in a war. And two. In July, in July 1653, in July 1660, 15, 1650, he, he makes a deal with the aristocratic class of his estate called the Junkers, J-U-N-K-E-R-S, J-U-N-K-E-R, they are the great aristocrats. What does he say? Guys, I need some money. And you give me money, I'll get off your back. They give him five hundred thousand dollars. I cannot translate that into bucks. If you want to say five hundred five hundred thousand, you're free to do so. They get off his back. What does he do? He uses it, and he he wins. He wins a war with Sweden. He wins a war with Sweden. By the time the great elector dies in 1688, the Prussian army, the Prussian army is 30,000 men. The, 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 Bre- the Brandenburg army, the Brandenburg army is 30,000 men. His son, Frederick I, is a non-entity. He comes to the throne in 1688. He dies in 1713. All we need remember about Frederick I is this. In the year 1701, in the year 1701, Frederick I makes a very complex deal with the Holy Roman Emperor. And as a result of this deal, Frederick becomes king in Prussia. 
Clash is on the map as a, as a terror in 1701. 1701. Other than that, this guy is a non entity. His son comes to the throne in 1713. His name is Frederick William I. What does he do? One. He builds houses. He drains canals. He drains swamps. He drains swamps and he builds canals. He drains swamps. He builds canals and he builds houses. But his major, his major accomplishments are military. What does he do militarily? Three things. He divides his kingdom of Prussia into 500 districts or cantons. C-A-N-T-O-N-S. He attaches the Prussian army to each of these 500 cantons. He's got a quota to meet each year for conscription. If that quota is not met, the army marches into the cantons and dragoons peasants out of the camp and into the army. That's called the canton system. 500 cantons. The Prussian army is attached to each. If the quota is not met, the, 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 re, the regiment goes into the and and, and, and yeah, yanks out peasants to become soldiers in the Prussian army. Two, he repeals the Edict of July of July 1653. He wants to make sure, he wants to make sure that the, no, that the officer, the officer class of the Prussian army is composed of nobility. The Yorkers are fine with this. Three, three, he builds. He builds a cadet school, a cadet school in Berlin. He builds a cadet school in Berlin. And he's got his advisors to go through. They draw up a list of all, all the noble families, all the noble families in Prussia, all the noble families, and each, each one of the noble families sends one of their sons, one of their sons, to this cadet school in Berlin. One of their sons, to this cadet school in Berlin. Frederick William I is very fond of this cadet school and wants to get, make sure, make sure that the officers that come there, that come there, feel they're, they're, they're close to their king. He goes on he, he, he eats with them. He goes on maneuvers with them. He goes on drills. He does drills with them. He does everything except sleep with them. He may even do that for all I know. <laughs> Not really. Hold on. He wants, a, a bu- he wants to buy them with the soldiers that come to Berlin, the officer class that comes to Berlin. By the time he dies, by the time he dies in 1740, the Prussian army numbers 80,000 men. 80,000 men. Three things. The Canton system. The army is attached to the 500 districts. They, they, if the recruits aren't met, they're, they, they're, they're, they, the army marches to, to the Canton and puts peasants in the army. He repeals the Edict of 1653. That's cool with the, the nobility. And he, may, he, may, he makes the, the, the nobility. The, 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 son, the sons of nobility come, come, come to Berlin for training. He, he wants to promote an esprit de corps in the Prussian army. He does everything with these cadets, except with the last thing, perhaps. Um, and by the time, by the time he died in the year 1688, 66, 1740, the Prussian army, the Prussian army numbers, numbers 40, 80,000 men. 80,000, but one thing. Frederick William I, Canton system, repeals the Ordinance of 1653, establishes this cadet school. The Prussian army reaches 80,000. He's afraid to use the army. He won't use it at all. Why? He fears if he's defeated. If the army's defeated, then goes his kingdom. His son has no such inhibitions. His son comes to the throne in the year 1740. His son's name is Frederick the Great, Frederick II at the time, going to be known as Frederick the Great later on. A couple of things about Frederick the Great. He doesn't like his father at all. They hate each other. Frederick has a friend, very close to this friend. He runs away with this friend from his father. His father catches the friend, and, and he, he, brings the, he brings them back to Berlin. Frederick the, Fred, the, Frederick the Great, Frederick the Second, is forced to watch. His friend being executed by his father. He's put before, he's put before a firing squad. His father doesn't want like his son because he thinks Fred, Frederick is effeminate. Frederick is effeminate. 
He doesn't like Fred. Frederick doesn't get along very well with women at all. In fact, there's a lot of evidence. There's a lot of evidence. Frederick the, Frederick the Great was gay. Ensign, he marries an English princess whom he cannot stand. He builds a palace in, 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 Bur- in Potsdam to get away from the woman. He, a, la- a lapse of two years goes on. He sees her after two years. After two, the first thing he says to his wife, my God, have you gained weight? <laughs> have you got fat? Something else. So, so he, he does not have relationships with women at all. He is a brilliant king. A brilliant if you, he is infatuated, infatuated with the French, infatuated with everything French. In fact, Fred, believe this, König das Glauben, believe this, French is spoken at the court of Frederick the Great, not German. French is spoken at Frederick's, Frederick the Great, not German. He loves the French language and everything French. Loves the French language and everything French. He writes 50 books, 50 books in the time he's on the throne. 50 books. His major reforms are three. His major reforms are three. One, economic. What, two, legal. And three, of course, military. Economic. Prussia annexes Silesia. What year did Prussia annex Silesia? 1740, right. What was Silesia? The richest province as a result of the annexation of Silesia. Prussia's territory is expanded by one third, and Prussia has this in, in, incredibly rich, incredibly enriched land, land from which to build. Under Frederick the Great, here's a statistic you're going to love. Under Frederick the Great, Prussia, by the end of his reign, becomes the fourth largest producer of textiles in Europe. Take that to the bank and run with it. The fourth largest producer of textiles in Europe. Legal. Frederick codifies the Prussian legal system. The, 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 general, the general Prussian legal code. The general Prussian legal code of 17... The Allgemeine Landgericht. The general Prussian legal code of 1794. What does it do? Frederick makes in the... Pre- it, it's published in the year 1794. The general Prussian legal code of 1794. It is published eight years after Frederick the Great dies. Eight years after Frederick the Great dies. What is it? In the opening, he says this. My power to rule does not come from God. My power comes from the state. My power to rule does not come from God. My power. My power comes from the state. He says, I do not have rights. I do not have rights. I have duties. I have duties to my subject. I do not have rights. I have duties to my subjects. And my subjects have duties to me. What are their duties? They must obey the law. They must pay taxes. And they must serve in war. They must obey the law. They must pay taxes. And they must, and they must serve in war. If applicable. And he codifies the Prussian legal code to make things so. Obsolete laws are done away with. Obsolete laws are done away with. Confusing laws are simplified. Confusing laws are simplified. Redundant laws, redundant laws are consolidated. Redundant laws are consolidated. Obsolete laws are done, are eliminated. Confusing laws are simplified. That is the, I did not get, we don't have a chance to go into the, 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 how, how dramatically that affected thinking throughout the 18th century about the legal system. But it did. The, the general Prussian legal code of 1794, one of the great documents, one of the greatest documents ever written in the 18th, 18th all, all done by Frederick the Great. He says, my, I, I do not have duties. I, 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 have, I have rights. I, I, have, I have duties to my citizens. I have duties to my, and my subjects have duties to me. My power, my power comes from the state. It does not come from God. Obsolete rules are done away with. Confusing rules are simplified. Redundant rules are consolidated. It is major. Major reform is military. Frederick the Great revolutionizes... Don't want to sound too loud. I know some of you have already voiced concerns about that. It gets better, guys. You'll get used to it as the time goes on. 
And there's always the podcast you can turn down, you know. He revolutionizes. <laughs> it doesn't sound good that way. It just doesn't sound good that way. He revolutionizes. It's the laws of warfare in the 17th century. How does this start? It starts in the War of Austrian Succession. What occurs? 36,000 Prussian soldiers desert. What does Frederick do? He's got a bit mercenaries. Where do the mercenaries come from? They come from Ireland. This creates a problem. It creates three big problems indeed. Number one, they cost money. That's less money he can spend. He can spend on intelligence, which he desperately needs a lot of. Two, they don't speak German. They create a morale problem. They create a morale problem. Three, three, they bring their families with them. They bring their families with them. This slows down. This slows down the speed of the Prussian advance. They cost money. They cost money. That's less money than he has to spend on intelligence. He needs a lot of that. Because he's always looking out for what Maria Theresa is about to do. He does not trust her any more than she trusts him. And the, 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 Irish, the Irish do not speak. They, 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 create, they create a morale. They don't fit in. They just don't fit in. And, and, they, and they, they bring their family. They slow down. They slow down the speed of the Prussian advance. Frederick, therefore, says there has to be a new way, a new way of waging war. Prussia is not is not its object in war. Is not to smash. Is not to smash the enemy. Prussia's object in war is to surprise the enemy. Prussia's object in war is to outflank the enemy. Prussia's object in war is to starve the enemy to death. Surprise the enemy. Outflank the enemy. Outflank the enemy. Star, starve the enemy to death. Starve the enemy to death. And it works very well. Two more, or three more things, Frederick does, to make the Prussian infantry, infantry, the finest infantry, the finest infantry in Europe. He gives his men a magnificent new weapon. It is called the flintlock rifle. The flintlock rifle replaces the old matchlock rifle. The flintlock rifle loads at the breech. I'm sorry, not, not at the muscle. It loads at the breach, not at the... It, it, uses, it uses paper car. It uses paper car. It, 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 makes, it, makes, it makes firing that much cleaner and that much easier. That much cleaner and that much easier. The flintlock rifle is one. Two, he changes the concept of linear formation. It used to be that six Prussian soldiers would drop to the ground before they fired their gun, their rifle. Frederick says that was not work. Instead, instead of six, instead of six, six become three. They can, they, can, they can fire quicker. They can fire quicker. They can fire more effective. And they can save wear and tear on their pant legs. So that's two things. The, the, the flintlock rifle. The flintlock rifle. And this linear... Yes? No. I'll check. They loaded, they loaded the breach according to what I got. But I'll check on you. Thank you. I'll write that down. Yes. Well, he changed that. <laughs> <laughs> they loaded the bridges. For, loaded the, they loaded the, uh, not at the bridge. I'm just thinking. Their percussion that loaded, that loaded, that loaded, that loaded, <laughs> that loaded, not at the, at the bridge, not at the muzzle. That's where my information comes from. But we, can, we can go over it. Anyway, they like this rifle very much, okay? <laughs> <laughs> it's nice and big, and it's shiny and bright. And so, and it's effective. <laughs> Who the hell cares where it loads? <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> Not, no disrespect for uh, your professor in political science. Um, uh, and, and this concept of linear formation. So what happens? The Prussian army marches in a line column, surrounded by officers, surrounded by officers, to the beat of drums, to the beat of drums with soldiers, with soldiers singing Lutheran hymns. It marches in a line column, in a line column, surrounded by officers, surrounded by officers, to the beat of drums, 
to the beat of drums with soldiers, with soldiers singing Lutheran hymns. It becomes the best, the finest, basically the finest army, the fi- one of the finest armies in all Europe, considering the size of the Prussian state, considering the, the, the size of the Prussian state, the finest infantry in all Europe, the, 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 the general land code, law code of the Prussian state and and finally and finally finally the the the, 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 the development of a textile industry let's return now to Vienna the year is 1753 17th one of the main things I didn't tell you about what Maria Theresia does in 1753 she appoints a new chancellor of her empire his name is Karl Anton von Kaunitz K-A-U-N, N-I-T-Z, K-A-U-N-N-I-T-Z. He will be chancellor of the Habsburg, the, of the Habsburg monarchy, chancellor for 40 years until 1793. Kaunitz is a diplomatic genius. Kaunitz is a diplomatic genius. Kaunitz comes from, Kaunitz comes from Silesia. That's where Frederick, Frederick, which Frederick the Great stole in the year 1740. Counts, like Maria Theresia, regards the act of Frederick as a crime, as a crime, not as an act of war. He sits around, discusses what to do, what to do about how to get Silesia back with Maria Theresia and her husband. Her husband is whom? Stevens Francis of Lorraine. Counts has an idea. He says, well, first of all, our goal should not be to get back Silesia. Our goal should be to get back Silesia and wipe Frederick the Great and Prussia off the map. He says, we cannot do this the way we've been acting diplomatically. We've got to change our game. We've got to change our thinking. We must ally ourselves. We must ally ourselves with the strongest power in Europe, with the strongest power in Europe. That power, that power happens to be, that power happens to be France. Kaunitz and Maria Theresia drop their jaw. They can't believe what they hear. Why? From the dawn of European history, from the dawn of European history, antagonism, between France and the House of Habsburg had been axiomatic. From the dawn of European history, antagonism between France and the House of Habsburg had been axiomatic. The dramatic reconciliation of these two powers in the middle of the 18th century is often and rightly seen as the greatest of all diplomatic. For 300 years, these powers have been at each other's throats. In the 16th century, the Habsburg ma- ma- married, married themselves to, 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 to territory, territories around France. They had, they had the French circled in. In the 17th century, the French intervened in the Seven Years' War. In the 18th century, the French intervened in the Habsburg Mon. These powers hate each other. There's no way, there's no way, there's no way, no way France and Austria can ever become allies, say Maria Theresa and her, her husband, Stephen Francis of Lorraine. Count it says, leave it to me. It wasn't all counts. It so happens, counts for all his hatred of Frederick the Great. Frederick the Great and Counts have two things in common. I didn't tell you this. Austria had an ally in the war of Austrian succession. The ally Austria had was England. Counts did not like the way the English treated the Austrians. Oh, they, they, for, they forced the Austrians, they forced the Austrians to fight. They forced the Austrians to fight in the Netherlands and not in, not, not in Central, they were, where they wanted to get, get back Silesia. They don't like this at all. Well, Countess is not the only one who disliked his ally. It's in, in, I didn't tell you this either. In the War of Austrian Succession, Frederick the Great had an ally. The ally Frederick the Great had was France. 
Frederick the Great did not like the way France treated Prussia in the War of Austrian Succession. What did they do? Two things. They didn't march to Vienna. They marched to Munich. And they put a Bavarian on the throne of the Holy Roman Empire. Two. They promised Frederick. They promised Frederick 50,000 men and they sent 15. They promised Frederick 50,000 men and they sent 15. Frederick the Great's advisor. And they say these numbers suck. They just suck. <laughs> Frederick takes the step that inaugurates, ignites this world famous diplomatic revolution, although I know some of you probably have not heard, most of you. What does he do? It goes like this, guys. Frederick learns, first, that Great Britain and England have signed, excuse me, Great Britain and France, the grow Great Britain and Russia have signed an alliance. Great Britain is very concerned about one province in the Holy Roman Empire. That province is Hanover. That's where the English kings come from, or English queens. Frederick hears this, and he's terrified about the prospect of Russian troops right next door to Prussia. Frederick runs to the British. He said, guess what? What? The Russians. The Russians cannot do you any good. The Russians are tied down in Poland and Turkey. I can. I can do it cheaper. And I'm right next door. I'm right next door. And I'll do it cheaper. The British say, hey, that makes sense. So um, in January, in January, in January 1756, Great Britain and France signed the famous Convention of Westminster. They signed the famous W-E-S-T-M-I-N-S-T-E-R. The famous, the famous convention. All it says, the British will give Frederick money and Frederick will protect Saxony. It never occurs to Frederick the Great that by doing this, he's going to touch off a diplomatic rebel. Why? He, the prospect of France allying itself with his mortal enemy, Austria, is out of the question. There's 300 years of antagonism. But Frederick is 300 years behind the times. By the middle of the 18th century, by the middle of the 18th century, the, 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 the mortal antagonist, the mortal antagonist of France is no longer Austria. The mortal antagonist of France is England. The, the, Brit the British and the French are fighting all over the world. The French say, how dare this upstart king make an, al an alliance, an alliance with our enemy, an alliance with our arch enemy. Count it, count it here, and he rushes to Paris. He rushes to Paris. And the French and the Austrians sign a treaty of alliance. Now, the treaty says, it, it's, it's a, it is a defensive, a defensive alliance signed in early 1756. It will not become offensive. It will not become offensive unless Frederick inaugurates a war. Frederick becomes the aggressor in an act of war. But Kaunitz, if a match, knows exactly what to do. Kaunitz is on very good terms with the Empress, the Tsaritsa, the Tsaritsa of Russia. Her name is Elizabeth I. Elizabeth I hates Frederick the Great almost as much as Maria Theresia does. Frederick the Great, during the War of Austrian Succession, stirred up trouble for Elizabeth in Sweden. Russia and Austria in the 1750s share a common goal. They want to see Frederick wiped off the map. They want to see Frederick wiped off the map. So the Austrians and the Russians make an alliance in 1756. They make an alliance in 17... And remember, remember now, remember now, France and all have half an alliance already. The Austro-Russian alliance is aggressive. Well, it turns out Frederick, Frederick's agents get wind of this alliance, get wind of it, Russia and Prussia. Our plotting is destruction. But then something happens. He learns that the Russians and the Austrians have decided, for reasons of weather, I guess, to postpone the, the, war, the war against Frederick for six months. For six months. Frederick says, I can't fight the war on their terms. 
I can't fight for, I must fight the war on mine. What does he do in 1756? Frederick the Great marched into the state next to Prussia. It's called Saxony. What does he do in, in Saxony, the capital of which is dreaded? He opens the archives. He opens the archives in the capital of Dredd. That is a, that is, that is a crime. That is a crime. That is a, and he, 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 he brands himself the aggressor. That's all the French need. The, def- the defensive treaty now becomes an offensive treaty. The defensive with Austria now becomes an offensive. So now we've got the Seven Years' War underway on the continent of Europe. It's Russia, Austria, and France against England and Prussia. Russia, Austria, and France against England and Prussia. Think about that for a minute. The population of Prussia is 4 million. Prussia is fighting a coalition of powers whose population totals 100 million. 100 million men. 100 million men and women. 10, how how many? 25 to 1. 4 million versus 100. The war goes well for Frederick at first, but soon disaster sets in. Frederick's mother, whom he loves very much, dies. I don't know when. He, his brother, whom he, he likes, his brother is in combat. He has to fire his brother. His mother dies. In 1761, in 1761, the Austrians and the Russians hook up. Oh, that's, they join forces, okay. Um, I, I should have known. It meant something different in the six, 1960s than it does today. All right, they join forces, okay. And, and, in, and in 1762, and in 1762, Russian troops, Russian troops occupy Berlin. This is the only time this will happen until 1945. The only time this happens until 1940. Russian troops occupy Berlin in the spring of 1762. Frederick thinks, Frederick thinks the end has come. He writes to his sister, I'd like to kill myself. Or I, I, I hope, I, I hope I am killed in battle. The end of Prussia has come. But personalities make a difference in history. It so happens that in 1762, in 1762, the Tsaritsa of Russia, Elizabeth I, dies. She is succeeded by her nephew, Peter III. Her nephew. His attitude toward Frederick the Great is 180 degrees removed from his aunt. Fred, Peter. Peter likes military things. Peter, Peter the third, Peter the third, Peter the the third, Peter Peter the third loves military. Peter the third is infatuated, is infatuated with Frederick the Great. Is absolutely infatuated with Frederick the Great. In fact, in fact, loves Frederick the Great. Is infatuated with has masturbation fantasies about Frederick the Great. (laughs) Two semesters ago, I got a question. Professor, is there, is there evidence for that? I said extensive. <laughs> <laughs> Cut me some slack. Okay. Anyway, Peter the Great is, is fond of Frederick the Great. Peter the, Peter the Third is fond of Frederick the Great. What does he do? He pulls Russian troops out of Berlin, and the war is saved for Frederick the Great. Frederick goes on. Frederick goes on to defeat Prussia on land, and the Seven Years' War comes to an end. He is saved. He is saved by the death of Elizabeth I, and the infatuation that is no for, for, for the, the, the Peter the Third. Peter the Third feels feel, feel for Frederick the Great. For Frederick the Great, the war ends in 1763. Prussia and Russia, Prussia and all, are still mortal enemies. The Austrians have not done all that well. All that well in the, in, the, in the Seven Years' War. Prussia and Austria have basically, have basically fought to a step. Frederick the Great was going to lose the war if, it had, if he hadn't lost, if it had not been. Had not been for the death of Elizabeth I. Now, stick with me. I said Joseph II wants to use his influence, his position, 
as Holy Roman Emperor to help Austria get, become stronger in Germany. And that exactly is what Joseph does after the war ends in, 17, in 1763. Joseph has, does four different things. Stick with me. One, an exchange scheme. An exchange scheme. Two, an alliance. Two, an alliance. And three, and three, another exchange scheme. What's the first exchange scheme? Two-thirds of Belgium for Bavaria. The Austrians want to give up Belgium in the worst way. It's far away. It's not Catholic. It's not Catholic. And it's hard to administer. It's far away. It's Catholic. And it's very hard to go. But there is something. But there, but there is all Catholic. It's all Catholic. It's, 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 next, it's next door. It's next door. And it's easy, easily to go. And something else. The elector of Bavaria, he elects the Holy Roman Emperor, one, is about to die out. His line is about to die out. And Joseph fears in the worst way. There's going to be a new war of succession if something is not done. There's going to be a new war of succession if it's not done. But Joseph goes about this pro- and the, gee, he offers the elector of Bavaria two-thirds of Belgium. And in return, Austria will take over Bavaria. Joseph goes about this project in the most ham-handed of ways. He does not consult the elector of Bavaria. He does not consult Bavaria's neighbors. God knows he does not consult Frederick the Great. What does he do? He marches Austrian troops into Bavaria in 1770 and, and sets off a war, a war between Austria and Prussia, a war between Austria and Prussia. 1778. Are you with me? Two-thirds of Belgium for Bavaria. Bavaria, close by, Catholic. The the successor is about to die out. He he, 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 he screws it up. He he does not consult the right. He marches Austrian trips into Bavaria. Frederick the Great retaliates by declaring war on Austria in 1778. The war is over quickly because 1778. But I should say this, though the war is over quickly, the aims of the two belligerents, the aims of the two belligerents are enormous. Frederick wants to destroy the Habsburg monarchy. He wants to destroy the Habsburg monarchy. Maria Theresa want to destroy Frederick the Great. They go, they go at it thinking that this, this war will just be, be the war that decides everything. But so, climate sets in. The winter of 1777, 1778, 1779, is one of the cold, the coldest winters in all of European history. More Prussian soldiers die of, 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 of frostbite. Frostbite than die of any of freeze to death. And they, how do they survive? They dig up potato. It's called the Kartoffelen Creek, which is potato in Germany. They, 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 they survive. They, the war ends. The war ends in a stalemate. In a stalemate. It, it ends in May. In May 1779 by the peace of Teschen. T-E-S-C-H-E-N. A peace concluded. A peace concluded between Austria and Prussia in May in May 1779. What does it say? Basically, everything reverts to a status quo ante. Battle. Prussia gets a few tariff, few, few, a few states, a few states, a few states in Germany. Austria promises to give up the exchange scheme for now. The exchange scheme for now. Prussia gets a few, a few states, a few very minor, minor states in, in Germany. Austria promised to give up, to give up the exchange scheme. Belgium for, for, for now. For now, for now, for now. The war cost each power heavily in terms of its military and political reputation. Neither gains anything by this peace of tension signed in 7 May of 1779. But there is a winner. There is a winner, Russia. And a loser 
and a loser of the Holy Roman Emperor. Catherine the Great is called on, she di- by Russia, by Austria and Prussia, to mediate, and she dictates the terms of the Peace of Teshin. She dictates the terms of the Peace of Teshin in 1779. Two, as a result of the peace, Russia and Catherine become protectors of the Holy Roman Empire. A dog, or, or what is it, the fox guarding the chicken house or something like that? It, it makes no sense. Russia has no interest in protecting the Holy Roman Empire at all. The Holy Roman Empire is not going to get sucked into this peace. Russia, Russia has with Poland, Russia has with Turkey. So again, this peace is, 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 a, is a standstill. Russia is the winner. The Holy Roman Emperor is the loser. And, and Prussia and Austria are losers as well. Joseph has a next scheme in 1781. Now, in 1781, his mother is dead. He is now. He is now Emperor of the Habsburg Monarchy and Holy Roman Emperor. He signs an alliance with Catherine, a new alliance in 1781. The, the alliance is this. Catherine wants to put her grandson on the throne of the Holy Roman, on the, of the Ottoman Empire. Joseph wants support for a, a new exchange scheme, but the alliance does not work for his projects. In it. Joseph and counts do not want do not want to see the Ottoman Empire disappear. The Ottoman Empire, the Ottoman Empire functions as a barrier, as a barrier between Austria and Turkey. Austria. And, and so the, the alliance really does not work out and as far as Catherine is concerned. Catherine does not want to support Joseph's project in Europe at all. Catherine wants to see Austria and Prussia at loggerheads. Austria and Prussia at law. The alliance does not work out at all. Joseph has a new idea in 1784. And guess what it is? A new exchange scheme. Guess what it is? Belgium for Bavaria. Surprise, surprise. There's two differences. Instead of two-thirds of Bavaria, he's going to give the ba- two-thirds of Belgium, he's going to give the Bavarian elector everything, and he's going to throw in a river called the Scheldt. S-C-H-E-L-D-T. S-C-H-E-L-D-T. All of Bavaria, all, all of Belgium, and the Scheldt. This scheme says there's no better than the first. The Dutch don't like it. If the Dutch don't like it, the British don't like it. And Catherine, Catherine is, is, is lukewarm to the whole thing. She wants to see Austria and Prussia at loggerheads, at loggerheads. As a result, as a result of these two, one, the alliance he makes with Russia, and two, what he does to Bavaria. There, <coughs> Joseph, there is a league, a league of princes formed in the Holy Roman Empire against Joseph II. In the year 1785, to stop Joseph in his track, to stop Joseph in his track, Joseph has done made two unforgivable sins. One, he's tried to destroy one state, Bavaria, and he's allied itself with Russia. He's allied himself with Russia, who wants, who's now protectorate of the Holy Roman Emperor. It is the middle-sized states of the Holy Roman Emperor that form this league of this first England, this league, this league of princes. But it's quickly taken over by Frederick the Great. Very good. Very good. By 1787. Start. 1786. Frederick the Great. Frederick the Great died in the year 1786. Frederick the Great goes to his grave thinking, thinking, believing, believing strongly that Prussia's next war, Prussia's next war, will be her last. Frederick is much too pessimistic. The state in trouble, the state in trouble by 1787, the power in trouble by 1787 is Austria. Austria, not Prussia. Austria, not Prussia. Austria's ally, France, is slipping and sliding into revolution. Russia and Turkey are on the verge of a new war into which Austria, as Russia's ally, is going to be dragged. There is discontent. There is discontent against Joseph. Against Joseph reforms at home. Discontent against Joseph reforms at home. Joseph, by, and so, by, by 1787. 1787, Austria is the power that is down, and Prussia, 
is really the power, the power that is in it. By seven, what, why? The balance of power, politics explains a lot. By set, the ba- balance of power politics by 1787 has really, has really become nothing more than a balance of conquest, than a balance of conquest. But Austria has risen to the position of a great power, but, but not by conquest alone. Austria has risen to the position of a great power, but by, by law, by the rule of law, by dynastic succession, by the rule, not by, not by conquest, not, by, not, not so much by war. There is a saying, Others may wage war, but you, lucky Austria, marry. That applies much more in the 16th and 17th century than it does in the end. A balance of calm. Mil- military might does not explain why Austria became the power she did. Law, dynastic succession, things like that. Not power alone. Not power alone. Let me close by reading a passage, I think very beautiful, from a book by James J. Sheehan. Some of you who took 158 this summer remember Professor Sheehan was one of my best friends from a book he wrote, uh, Where Have All the Soldiers Gone? Well, this is an even, this is a much longer book called Germany, 1770 to 1866, published in the year uh, 1990. Sheehan says this about Austria's dilemma. Just listen. The Habsburgs commanded the allegiance of a dozen nationalities. Their authority stretched across a bewildering variety of social and cultural landscapes. Their servants came throughout Europe. No single set of institutions, no one ideal, could possibly contain these various elements. Each owed its allegiance to the dynasty, but each interpreted that allegiance in in a very different way and expressed it through a distinctive set of institutions. German conversation, Italian music, Spanish ceremony filled every Habsburg day forming a complex tradition to be manipulated and preserved. Preserving and manipulating it proved to be the foundation of Habsburg glory and, as we shall see, the source of their ultimate destruction. Wednesday, the French Revolution. And I'll check about that rifle. I think everybody's wrong. Just remember it's a nice rifle and everybody likes it.